Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you've all recovered from last week's case because my god that was intense that was definitely the most intense video i have ever done so today we're going to be talking about the case of mark hacking now mark was your typical serial liar and i'm sure we have all known or know somebody like that that just lies about everything the smallest things the biggest things it's almost like they can't help it they lie about absolutely everything they lie about things that they don't even need to lie about not that you should lie anyway but you know they lie about the smallest things about like like what they had for dinner. It's like, why are you lying about that? Why does it matter? Every single thing that comes out of their mouth is a lie. Well, Mark Hacking was one of those people. He would lie to his wife, his family, his friends, pretty much everyone around him. And the lying started from a very young age. He would start lying about the smallest things. And then as he got older, the lies became more extreme and pretty much his whole life was a lie. But then the lies started to come out as they always do. Do. And Mark didn't know how to handle this. He couldn't allow his double life to unravel. Anybody who can come, please come. And unfortunately, this resulted in some absolutely heartbreaking consequences. So that is what we are going to be covering today. But before we get into today's case, we do have a sponsor. So I just want to thank Audible so much for sponsoring today's video. Now I have spoken about Audible so many times now. I love Audible so much. And if you weren't aware, Audible is the world's leading provider in audiobooks. So if you love to listen to your books, over reading them, then Audible is the place for you. One book in particular that I was listening to very recently is a book called If You Tell by Greg Olson, which dives into the case of Shelley Notek, which was obviously the horrifying case that we covered last week. And the book If You Tell, wow, it is incredible. It's definitely one of the most intense books I've ever listened to. And when I was looking through the comments on last week's video, a lot of you agree. I have actually never seen so many comments from so many of you recommending a book, talking about a book. So the author, Greg Olson, basically sat down with Shelley Notek's three daughters. So that was Nikki, Sammy, and Tori. And all three of them gave their first-hand account of the harrowing events that happened in their life living with Shelley Notek. And the actual story of Shelley Notek is absolutely heartbreaking and reaches the lowest depths of depravity you could even think of. But in terms of a true crime book, it is absolutely incredible. It goes into so much detail. You really feel the story. You get invested in the story. You feel the victim's pain. You feel emotional when you're listening to this story. And it's number one on the Amazon true crime charts for a reason. And I binged all 10 hours in a few days. Like I couldn't stop listening to it. I was on the edge of my seat throughout this whole book. And last week's video, as you guys know, was very, very long. And I did include most of the details, but it's impossible to include absolutely everything but the book goes into so much more detail and the narrator telling the story as well was absolutely incredible she put on different voices for the different characters in the story and the voice that she had for Shelley Notek oh my god would make my blood boil she was able to capture the tone and the venom in Shelley's voice and it made me hate her even more than I thought was possible so if you haven't come across the book if you tell by Greg Olson you 100% need to listen to it it is so so good I cannot recommend this book enough and you guys can get a free yes a completely free 30-day trial by going to the link in my description box or by going to audible.com forward slash danielle or by texting danielle to 500 500 again that is audible.com forward slash danielle or text danielle to 500 500 and you guys can get a free 30-day trial and go listen to if you tell by greg olson thank you so much audible for sponsoring today's video but thank you to every single one of you watching right now because without all of you guys i wouldn't get opportunities like this and now let's jump into today's case. So I have a feeling Sassy Danielle is going to be coming out in this video which I don't feel like she's made an appearance in a while so are you guys ready for Sassy Sunday? Mark Hacking was born on the 24th of April 1978 making him a Taurus. He grew up in Orem, Utah which is just outside of Salt Lake City where he lived with his parents Doug and Janet Hacking and his six other siblings. It was a very big family 
So he had three brothers, Lance, Chad, and Scott. And then he had three sisters, Tiffany, Sarah, and Julie. Mark came from a Mormon family and was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And religion was very, very important to the family. They attended church regularly. The whole family was very respected in the community. His dad was a local pediatrician. The family had very decent money. They had a nice house. It was kind of like a picture perfect family, if you know what I mean. All of the kids were very high achievers in various different things, academically, in sports. They were all at the top of their game. And the image of this picture perfect family was very important to the family. They wanted to maintain that. And from a very young age, Mark felt the pressure to succeed in life to also be a high achiever. Now, we don't know if his parents actually did put pressure on him to be a high achiever or he just naturally felt pressure because the rest of his family were high achievers. Like we don't know, but we just know that he did feel pressure to fit in with the rest of his family. And growing up, Mark was described as a very active child. He would always be outside hiking in the mountains in Utah. He was always outside playing sports. He had dreams of becoming an Eagle Scout. But what Mark actually loved in life more than anything else was to make people laugh. But it wasn't in the way of, oh, I wanna make people laugh because I wanna make people smile. I wanna brighten their day. Mark wanted to make people laugh to get attention. Mark craved attention. He was obsessed with getting attention in any way that he could. Mark was described as the class clown. He was basically that person in school that was just an idiot and was an idiot on purpose just to get attention from the rest of the class to make the rest of the class laugh. He basically did anything that he could to make people look at him make people laugh at him even if it made him look stupid. I saw it many times myself people like swinging on their chairs like leaning back and leaning back way too far to intentionally fall off their chair to make the rest of the class laugh. And a few different examples of what Mark used to do to gain attention is that he would wear shoes that were way too big for him. So when he was playing football, when he was playing any kind of sports, they would fly off and he would fall over and everyone would laugh at him. He would intentionally smear dirt all over his face and say, oh, look, I fell over. I'm such a klutz. I'm so stupid. He basically would set up these fake situations to make other people think that he was a klutz. And some people are naturally clumsy. They are, but Mark wasn't. He would pretend to get in accidents all the time. I mean, sometimes he actually did get in accidents, but they were still on purpose. And it really was when he was in school that he started to hone his skills as a master in deceit. It may seem harmless as a child, like does it really matter if he's wearing shoes that are too big and they're gonna come flying off? Like, does that really matter? No. But the thing is with Mark is that lying and faking all of these things became a way of life for him. And that's when it becomes the problem because when he was younger, it would just be little things. He would lie about the fact that he'd fallen over even though he hadn't. However, as he grew older, the lies became more extreme and they led to deadly consequences. So eventually Mark moves on to high school. And by the time he gets to the 11th grade, he becomes close to a girl, Lori Suarez. So Lori Suarez was born on the 31st of December, 1976. She also grew up in a Mormon family and she was adopted at just four months old by her parents Thelma and Araldo. She also had an older brother called Paul who was also adopted at the same time by her parents. Growing up, Lori was described as being very, very popular. She was liked by so many people. She was outgoing. She was confident. She was smart. She lived in California for the first 10 years of her life. However, when she was 10, her parents did divorce. And after the divorce, this is when Lori and and her mom decided to move to Orem in Utah to be closer to like-minded people in the Mormon community. And Lori had to leave behind her dad and her brother Paul because they stayed in California. And Lori was absolutely crushed to be leaving her dad and her brother, but when she got to Orem, she thrived. And she also became incredibly close to her mom as well. They were best friends, they were inseparable, they did everything together. And when she went to high school, this is when she really began to shine. 
time because she was incredibly smart, higher than average for her age. She became the class president. She played so many sports. She was very intelligent. She was popular. Everyone saw her as kind and caring. And by the time Laurie was 15, this is when she met Mark Hacking. And the two of them actually met when they both went on a camping trip. They didn't go together. They both went with their separate group of friends and they were just in the same area. Laurie and Mark had never interacted before this camping trip. And Mark was being Mark at the camping trip. He was acting a fool, pretending to hurt himself, trying to get attention. And one of the nights, a lot of people that were camping in that area were all gathered around a campfire. And Mark, being Mark, because he's so stupid, decided to put his hand in the fire and turn over one of the logs. It's like, why couldn't you just get a stick or something to turn over? Or like, why the hell would you put your hand in fire? And to no surprise, he got severely burnt. He, he did get burnt in this case. This was not a lie, this accident. And Laurie, being the kind and caring person that she was, saw what happened and ran over to Mark and said, are you okay? I can help. I know first aid. So she tended to his hand and this is how they met. And it's just so stupid. Like why would he put his hand in fire? But he was looking to get attention. I don't actually know if he was looking to get attention from Laurie. I think he was just looking to get attention from anyone and his plan worked. So as she tended to Mark's hand, the two of them got chatting and that was that. They quickly fell for one another. The two of them literally became high school sweethearts. They were inseparable and a lot of people saw them as this young power couple. They were both popular. They were both intelligent. They were both good at sports. Laurie's mom also loved Mark as well. She highly approved of him. And it all started out great. Like, this is amazing. And if only it could have stayed like that. So after Mark has graduated high school and when he turns 19, this is when he's going to go on his first mission for the Mormon church. So for those of you who are not aware, and I am no expert, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but going on a mission is almost like a rite of passage in the Mormon religion. So all Mormon men between the ages of 19 and 26 are eligible to go on a mission. And women are eligible as well, but I don't think it's as common for women to go on missions. And if they are accepted onto the mission, they spend two years on location trying to convert other people into the Mormon faith. And the missions require long working days. I think the working days are like 16 hours. And the missionaries do various different things to try and convert people to the Mormon faith. They go door to door. Sometimes they stand in like a public busy area trying to get the attention of strangers. And it's said that when they are on this mission, every single thing that they are doing is being scrutinized. As well as all of that, missionaries are not allowed any contact with their family members. They are only allowed to phone home on Christmas Day and Mother's Day. They are taught to smile, listen, find common ground with strangers, basically do everything in their power to convert people to their faith. There are also a ton of rules that the missionaries must abide by when they are on location. They are forbidden from drinking, smoking, no caffeine, no TV, no films, no music. Only books are allowed to be read that are of a religious nature and they are not allowed to come into contact with the opposite sex. So Mark, for his mission, he was sent to Winnipeg in Canada. And when he started his mission, it said that Mark excelled, which I'm not surprised about because he does excel in a lot of things to begin with. But with Mark, he never has conviction. He never sticks to anything. Let me just tell you that. Mark was actually a natural salesman. He was really good at converting people to the Mormon faith. He did really well at interacting with strangers. He did really well door to door. But even though Mark was really good at the selling aspect of the mission, there was one part that he really struggled with and that was following all of the rules. Mark basically broke every single rule. Apart from the phoning home, he stuck to that one, but he broke every other one. Where he was, it was a college town. And with college towns, you see a lot of drinking, smoking, partying, etc. And Mark just couldn't resist. He was soon sneaking out, going to bars, chatting with girls, which was obviously not allowed. Mark was loving this newfound freedom that he had because even though the rules on the mission are a lot stricter than he had at home, he still didn't have this much freedom at home and he was absolutely loving it. He was no longer with his family that were monitoring him 24 seven. And he did feel a lot of pressure from his family as well. And he didn't feel that pressure on the mission because the people that he was around 
didn't know him. He didn't have to be this perfect person in this perfect family, getting perfect grades, performing perfectly at sports, etc. He became a complete party animal and it's thought that when he was on the mission, he was also sleeping with other girls and he is still in a relationship with Laurie and Laurie didn't know about this. Laurie wasn't okay with this. So he was doing this behind her back and it's reported that he was sleeping with a lot of the young girls that he was converting to the Mormon and charge, which is not okay. Like, no. I mean, obviously cheating is not okay anyway, but taking advantage of your position and of younger girls and sleeping with them, yeah, no, that is not okay. That is absolutely disgusting. And thankfully his behavior, this predatory behavior didn't last for too long because he did get caught. And after he was caught, he was promptly sent home. Now it said that if anyone is sent home from a mission, this brings great shame on the family. Like this is really embarrassing. And remember Mark's family have an image to uphold, but Mark, Mark is a natural born liar. So he lied his way out of the situation, which I honestly don't know how he did. He tried to play off to his family that it was a mistake. He doesn't know why he was sent home. It's all a complete misunderstanding. And unbelievably, his family believed him and Mark's behavior, especially the cheating, no one knew about. And Laurie was deeply suspicious that Mark had been cheating on her, but she chose to believe him. And in the end, Mark got away with everything, cheating, everything. And I don't actually know how long Mark was on the mission for before he got sent home, because obviously the missions normally last for two years. So I don't know how long he was on it, but to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't even last two months. So after Mark returned home from the mission, his and Laura's relationship continued to blossom. They both go on to study at the University of Utah. And just before they were both due to graduate, they actually did get married in a really beautiful ceremony in a Mormon temple. Now, Lori accepted at university just like she did at school and she went on to graduate with honors in business and then straight out of university she went on to get a very good job at Wells Fargo like she was doing extremely well everything was just clicking into place for her and she was excelling Mark was trained towards becoming a doctor he had dreams of attending medical school so he didn't graduate at the same time as Laurie he carried on for a few more years to carry on his studies to get into medical school he also at the same time as his studies got a job working part-time in a local hospital and all things right now seem to be going pretty well like I said Laurie is doing really well for herself Mark is studying to one day become a doctor their marriage is going great Laurie knew that Mark wasn't perfect she knew that he was prone to telling the odd white lie here and there but she didn't see it as the biggest deal in the world she loved Mark and they just made sense together they had so much fun together it was literally Literally the perfect marriage, but not everything is always the perfect picture that it seems. Okay, so now we're gonna skip forward a few years. It is now 2004. Both Laurie and Mark are now in their late 20s. They have been married for approximately five years at this point. Laurie is still at her job at Wells Fargo and thriving. However, Mark, who is currently aged 28, is still at university trying to get his pre-med degree. And I couldn't actually find out why it was supposed to be taking him so long because as far as I'm aware, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it approximately takes about four years to get your pre-med degree before you go on to medical school. And Mark has been at college for a very long time at this point. So I don't really know what is going on there, but when we get to 2004, Mark is finally graduating, or should I say, apparently graduating because all was not as it seemed, which we will get onto very soon. So after Mark had graduated. He told Laurie and his friends and family that he had gotten a place at a medical school in North Carolina to study oncology. And Laurie was absolutely thrilled for him. I mean, this was his dream to go to medical school. She was sad at the same time though, because this meant that she would have to leave her friends and family. She would also have to leave her job, but this is what she was willing to do. So Mark and Laurie have a big going away party. And at approximately the same time, Laurie also finds out 
about something else and that is that she's fallen pregnant. So a lot is happening for this couple right now. They are both going on that journey to become parents. They are moving essentially across the country to a different state. Mark was going to medical school to become a doctor and Laurie was going to have to find a new job and change up her whole life and everything. But even though it was a lot of change, things were still going great for the couple. But like I've said a million times already, not everything was as good as it seemed and Laurie was about to discover quite a few things that would be devastating. So on the 16th of July, Laurie is making preparations for the big move and she calls up the University of North Carolina to talk to them about financial aid. She just wants to discuss a few options like how it's going to work, etc. And when she makes this phone call, the university say to her, we don't know a Mark Hacking. A Mark Hacking isn't going to medical school here. And in fact, Mark Hacking never applied to medical school here. And Laurie was shocked. She just couldn't believe it. She was not expecting this. She just innocently made this phone call to inquire about financial aid and where they were gonna live, etc. And now her whole world has come crumbling down around her. And right now, Laurie is thinking, what the hell is going on? I am pregnant. We are moving across country. I've left my job. And apparently Mark is not even going to medical school. What the hell is going on? And she confronts Mark straight away. She says, listen, what the hell is going on? This university doesn't know who you are. They have no records of you even applying there. Tell me what the hell is going on. And of course, Mark lies about everything. So he lies about this as well. He straight up denies the whole thing. And he says, oh, it must be a mix up. There must be some technical issue error in the computer system. I've applied there and I'm going there. But Laurie knows her husband. She is aware that he is prone to lying. So she doesn't believe him. And she does a little bit more digging and she finds out even more devastating news. Because it turns out not only had Mark never applied to medical school, but he had also dropped out of his pre-med degree over two years ago. It turns out that Mark was living a complete fake life. He was lying to everyone. He was telling everybody that he was still at university. He was still trying to get his pre-med degree when he dropped out over two years ago. Every day for the last two years, he pretended to go to university. He packed up his bags with all of his books. He went to campus and he waited until Laurie went to work and he snuck back into the house to play video games all day. He was pretending to everyone that he was this hard-working student and he was really stressed out with all of these really difficult papers and assignments that he had to do. And Lori, she is working. She is bringing in the majority of the money into this household. She is funding Mark's fake student life. He is literally sat on his ass all day playing video games when Lori is out slaving away at work. She is now pregnant and she hasn't got a clue about any of this. And Mark went to extreme lengths to keep this lie going. He definitely played his part well. I mean, bloody hell, he deserves an Oscar. On most evenings when Laurie returned home from work, he would sit and pretend to do his homework. There were even times where he would meet Laurie on campus for lunch. He would even discuss his coursework with Laurie's mom and ask her to review his papers. I'm telling you, he went to extreme lengths to keep up this lie. It's just so crazy. He put in so much effort into all of these lies, why couldn't he have just put in effort to get in his degree? He literally had everyone fooled, but the truth was that Mark had dropped out over two years ago and he dropped out because he was too lazy to finish his studies. And not that this is an excuse, but like I've said a couple of times, Mark did feel pressure from his family to succeed and he wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps to become a doctor. So he wanted to keep up this ruse that he was in pre-med school. And I do find it slightly suspicious. I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but because his dad is a doctor, and he has obviously gone through his pre-med degree and then gone on to medical school, surely he would have known, hang on a minute, you've been trying to get your pre-med degree for way too long, what's going on here? 
seems a bit suspicious, doesn't it? And remember about five, 10 minutes ago, I don't know how long ago in the video I said it, but Mark did have a graduation. Well, it turns out that Mark even faked that because on the day of his actual graduation, if he hadn't dropped out, Mark all of a sudden became really ill. Mark was throwing up everywhere, so he couldn't attend his graduation ceremony. Very convenient. But it turns out that Mark had actually taken something. I don't know what he took, but he took something to make him throw up. So Laurie and everyone else could see and hear that he was throwing up and he got out of attending his graduation ceremony. Instead, the family threw a small little get together, a small little graduation ceremony at home for him. And he even had his cap and gown to have photos taken. Again, the lengths that he will go to to keep this lie up is honestly unbelievable. It has been said that if Mark put in the same amount of effort into his degree as he did with lying, he would have graduated with flying colors. But what is just really crazy to me is that he is now lying about going to medical school. And I just don't know how he planned on pulling this off. I really don't because there is one thing to pretend that you're still going to university for two years, but then to get up and move across country to attend a medical school that you've never applied to or never been to, how is he gonna keep that up? Because even though he dropped out of university, he had still gone to the University of Utah. He still knew the campus, he still knew teachers, he still knew people. It was a lot easier for him to lie and keep up the facade that he was going there. But how is he gonna do that in North Carolina? Where does he see this going? When are the lies going to end? I mean, I assume they're probably never going to end. And Mark also, lied about the interview process for medical school. He was pretending to everyone that he was going to interviews all over the country to get into medical school. He was literally traveling all over the country, staying overnight in all of these different states. He went to Wisconsin, Washington, New York, North Carolina, obviously, and Vermont. And he was pretending that he was having interviews at medical schools in those states. And guess who was funding all of this? Laurie. Laurie was paying for his plane tickets. She was paying for his hotels. She was paying for everything. God knows what he was actually doing on these little trips that he was taking, but I feel so bad for Laurie because she's just being supportive. She is being a supportive partner and she's financially supporting him as well. She has made so many sacrifices for him and he is literally throwing it in her face. And things had become financially tough for Laurie and Mark, but Laurie made sacrifices sacrifices. She told herself, she told friends and family that he will all pay off one day. And when Mark did tell Lori that he had gotten a place at medical school in North Carolina, she was over the moon. She was so happy for him because everything was now coming true. All of his dreams were happening. She was willing to move across the country, quit her job, leave her friends and family. She was now pregnant and she was willing to do all of that. And it was all based on a lie. And I just don't know what his end goal was here. Why is he putting his wife through this? Why is he putting his pregnant wife through this? It's like, what is he actually going to do? Because he's obviously not going to medical school. So what's gonna happen? Is he just gonna pretend to go to medical school for however many years you go to medical school? Is he going to fake become a doctor? Or is he somehow going to stumble into becoming a doctor? I know that that shouldn't happen, but if any of you have watched Dr. Death, it can happen. So is there a Dr. Death situation going to happen all over again? I just really don't know what his goal was here. Like I really don't. And to be honest, I don't think Mark probably knew either. I feel like he was literally just going day by day, trying to live out this lie as long as possible. And right now Mark is going full steam ahead, attending medical school in North Carolina, moving himself and his pregnant wife to North Carolina. And this is when Laurie made the phone call to the University of North Carolina to inquire about financial aid. And this is when she found out about his lie. And this is when Mark and Laurie's world came crashing down. So it was the 16th of July, 2004, when Laurie made that phone call, when the truth came out. And a leaving party was held for the couple in anticipation of their move to North Carolina. But Laurie had found out the truth and she just tried to get through that party. She didn't tell anyone about the truth. She just tried to put it to the back of her mind. She knew there was nothing that she could do about it at that party. But at some point after the party, it's thought that this is when Laurie and Mark had a huge 
argument. And Laurie understandably was furious that Mark was completely turning their life upside down for a lie. So she confronted Mark about this and she also at some point wrote him a letter. In the letter she said quote, I want to grow old with you but I can't do it under these conditions. I can't imagine life with you if things don't change. I hate being home from work because it hurts to be in our apartment. Lori also told Mark that if he didn't change, she was going to file for divorce. Which I think Mark is extremely lucky that she hasn't already filed for divorce. The language that she used in that letter tells me that she is willing to talk about this, willing to work through it. She just wants Mark to own up to what he's done and change. What she is asking for is completely reasonable. Lori then went to bed and left Mark to read that letter. And Mark at some point read that letter on that evening and he filled up with rage. He thought to himself, how dare she do this to me? How dare she question me? How dare she dictate to me what I should do? I'm the man, I'm the husband, how dare she have an opinion on what I do. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm so angry. Mark truly thought that he had the authority because he was a man. Not only that, Mark was enraged that Laurie wanted him to come clean. Laurie wanted Mark to own up to what he had done, take responsibility, and Mark couldn't face his house of cards tumbling down. Mark couldn't take his doctor dad and his very successful family finding out about his failures. He would be embarrassed. He would be a laughing stock. And this is where Mark decided that he couldn't allow this to happen. He couldn't allow the truth to come out. He couldn't let Laurie expose his lies and his secret world. So that evening, Mark decided to take a terrible course of action that would lead to absolute tragedy. So now we skip forward to the next morning. It is now the 19th of July, 2004, and at approximately 10.07 a.m., Mark phones the police to report his wife, Lori, missing. Yep, that is right. After the night where they argued and Lori left him the letter, all of a sudden, she has gone missing. This is obviously very suspicious to all of us. We know that Mark is responsible for this, but right now, Laurie is the only person that knows about his secret life. To everybody else, Mark is this really successful person. He's done really good at his pre-med degree. He's about to attend medical school. He is a really loving and attentive husband. No one would be suspicious of him at this point. Mark told the police that Laurie had traveled to Memory Grove Park that morning to go jogging, which she did quite often, but on this morning she had not returned. Mark also phoned up Laurie's mom, Laurie's work, and anyone that may know where she is, but no one did. No one had a clue where Laurie was. Her car was soon found in a parking lot that was close to where she was supposed to be jogging. And once her car was found, this is when people started to get really, really concerned. This was not like Laurie at all. Why had she just abandoned her car like this? Like this was not like her. Laurie was also never late to work. And if she ever was, she would phone in. She was that kind of person but she hadn't phoned in. So the police at this point stepped up their efforts. They needed to find Lori. All of this was looking very suspicious. And this is when the investigation into the disappearance of Lori hacking began. So first off, the detectives ask Mark if they can look around the house. And Mark was like, yeah, sure. I've got nothing to hide, come on in. And immediately when the detectives entered the home, they could see that there was a few things that didn't seem quite right. First of all, the detectives noticed noticed that Laurie's purse was just on the counter and they were thinking to themselves, hmm, that's weird. Women normally take their purses with them. Now, <laughs> I don't like generalizations like that. And I feel like there was a lot of generalizations in this investigation. Women always do this, women do that, and I don't like them. Everyone is different. Some people will take their purses, handbags with them everywhere. Some people won't, but the detectives on this case thought that it was very weird that Laurie had left her purse at home. I suppose it could be seen as strange, I suppose. A lot of things in this investigation are definitely circumstantial. All of them added up definitely seem weird in isolation. They don't. So I suppose 
the past being left at home could be seen as strange. And then the detectives see Laurie's wedding ring on the side and they were thinking to themselves, hmm, that is really strange as well. Why would she take off her wedding ring to go jogging? Now, again, this is a little bit of a generalization, another one that I don't like. Lots of people take off their wedding ring for lots of different reasons. I, for example, take off my wedding ring for so many different things, one being work. And if I was to ever go for a jog, not that I do because I hate running, I would take off my wedding ring. And if I do any exercise, I do take off my wedding ring. Every one is different and that is okay. Some people will never take their wedding ring off and that is okay. But again, the detectives on this case thought that her wedding ring being left in her jewelry box was weird. And then next, the detectives found the key to Laurie's car. Now this is weird because the detectives were thinking, okay, well, how did Laurie drive her car, park it up? but then her keys are back at home. And when they did search Laura's car, they found the driver's seat was pushed way too far back. It was way too far back for someone of Laurie's height. Someone that sat in that car previously and driven it must have been really, really tall. And Laurie wasn't tall at all, but uh, Mark, was. So things were looking pretty suspicious now for Mark. Things are not looking good. And then to make matters worse, the detectives found the letter that Laurie had written to Mark. And obviously they read it. They found out that Laurie was threatening divorce if he didn't change. And now they were thinking, okay, there's clearly been some kind of argument. This sounds like a motive to me. And now that the police are starting to become suspicious of Mark, they also have this letter. So that is motive. They start looking looking at the apartment a little bit differently. And there's a few things around the apartment that just seem a bit strange. First of all, it was way too clean. Almost like someone was trying to cover something up. Second of all, they found a brand new mattress on the bed. And on this brand new mattress were brand new bed sheets that had just been taken out of the packaging. You know, when you get brand new bed sheets and they're folded up in that like plastic thing, you take them out and they have those deep creases in them. That is what these new bed sheets had. They had those deep creases. So the police knew that these were brand new sheets. And then they searched Mark's car and they found a receipt for a mattress from a nearby store. On the receipt, there was a timestamp and it said that this mattress was purchased at 10.23 a.m. Uh-huh, yeah, 10.23 a.m. that morning, which was 16 minutes after Mark had reported Laurie missing. And the police were just like, um, <laughs> what the hell? You've reported your wife missing and you think that now is the appropriate time to buy a new mattress and new bed sheets? Bring it back home, put the new mattress on the bed, make the bed, but your wife is missing. I'm sorry. Who the hell does that? I'll tell you who, no one but a guilty person. And it was the fact that he bought a new mattress after he reported his wife missing that really made the detectives think, yeah, like something is going on here. You are guilty, but right now we only have circumstantial evidence, so we can't really do anything about it, but the police are onto him. And then finally, the police find a hunting knife in the bedside table that was covered in fresh Blood. Now, Mark tried to play this off. He tried to say, oh, I've been hunting recently. And then I just put my knife in the bedside table, as you do. It's like, Mark, no one is buying that. No one does that. And after they found the hunting knife with the blood on, the police are now thinking, okay, he has probably murdered his wife. This is not just a missing person anymore. But all while this is going on, all while the investigation is going on and the detectives are closing in on Mark, the media has caught wind of the story and also the local community. And Mark is lapping up all of the attention that he's getting. We all know that Mark loves attention. He's really playing the role of a lifetime here. Mark even went on TV and started crying. Uh-huh, really? I called her at about 10 o'clock to just say hi, see how she was doing, and they told me she... Sorry, she never got to work. Anybody who can come, please come. Tomorrow morning, we're gonna... I don't think they're going to let the volunteers up there tonight. 
but we're going to start at 6.30 tomorrow morning, and anybody who can possibly... If you can make it, please come. That's all. He was crying about how tragic the disappearance of his wife is. Seriously, I'm fed up with these people. I'm fed up with people going on TV and pulling out the crocodile tears. I'm really bloody fed up. Mark really has no shame. Really no shame at all. He is a serial liar. And even still now, he is lying. He is painting the picture that he wants everyone else to see. He wants everyone to feel sorry for him. Give him attention. It literally makes me sick. Mark is going around playing the grieving, concerned husband, but the detectives are closing in on him. Traces of Laurie's blood are found in the bedroom. They also confirmed that the blood on the hunting knife was also Laurie's. On top of that, they also found her blood in Mark's car. And then the final nail in the coffin is that they found the mattress, the original mattress that Mark had thrown away. They found it in a dumpster a few blocks down. And when they found the mattress, a square had been cut out of the mattress. So you know when you're lying on a mattress, just imagine that where your body goes, all of that has been cut out. Like all of the inside of the mattress of that square that you lie on has been cut out. And it's like, who the hell cuts out a square of their mattress before throwing it away? Unless you're trying to cover something up. So at this point, the evidence was really piling up against Mark. The detectives were working bit by bit getting all of the evidence. And Mark was actually becoming concerned. He was thinking, oh my God, they're actually closing in on me. They're actually gonna figure out that I did this. But Mark had one last trick up his sleeve. His brain started racing and he started to think to himself, what lie can I tell to get out of this? And this is when a light bulb went off in his head and he thought to himself, you know what? I know the exact plan that is going to get me out of this. I am going to fake insanity. So in the early hours of the morning following Laura's disappearance, police were called out to a disturbance outside of a motel. And this disturbance was Mark running around naked. This was his big plan. This was how he was going to fake insanity. He was going to run around naked. Did he really think that that was going to work? So when the police arrived, I mean, obviously it's not normal for someone to be running around naked, is it? So the police were a little bit like, okay, what the hell is going on here? But when they saw Mark, he was running around naked, yes, but they noticed that he still had sandals on. And the police were thinking, huh, that's strange. If someone wasn't sane of mind and they were running around naked, why would they put shoes on to protect their feet? why would their mind be thinking like that? Again, that possibly is a little bit of a generalization. Everyone is different, but I do agree that is a little bit weird, isn't it? I mean, obviously we know that Mark is faking all of this. We know that he's not insane. And Mark, even though he's running around naked, he made sure to protect his feet because he didn't want to get hurt. And the police do come in contact with situations like this quite often. And they could see that Mark was faking it. They could see that this is not the behavior of someone that wasn't sane of mind. But the police don't arrest Mark straight away. He's actually transferred to a psychiatric hospital and the police, they are onto him and they want to gather more evidence before they do arrest him. So the police continue with their investigation, but what no one realizes right now is that Mark was living a secret life. No one knows this still, which is just so frustrating. However, that was soon all about to change. Mark's house of cards was soon gonna come tumbling down and the whole truth was soon about to be revealed. Detectives started pouring over Mark's background, everything about him, and they soon discovered that Mark was never attending medical school. He never even applied. And they also found out that he had dropped out of his pre-med degree two years prior. And this news went public that Mark was lying about his education and pretty soon everyone turned against him. And this is when Mark's friends and family started to become very suspicious because before they didn't wanna believe all of the rumors that had started to spread but now the evidence was glaring at them and they had to believe it. So it was at this point that two of Mark's brothers went to visit him in the psychiatric hospital and they said to him, listen, Mark, we need the truth. What 
has happened. And I don't think his brothers were prepared for what Mark was going to say. And I wasn't prepared either because Mark is a serial liar. I was not prepared for him to tell the truth, but that is exactly what he did. He gave a full confession to his brothers. He confessed to everything, all of the lies about the college, the medical school that he dropped out. And he also finally confessed to murdering Laurie. Mark told his brothers that on the evening of the 18th of July, 2004, after he read Laurie's letter, he became enraged. He became so enraged that he picked up his rifle. He walked into their bedroom where Laurie was sleeping, pointed the gun at the back of Laurie's head and pulled the trigger. Mark then confessed that he murdered Laurie to protect his secret fake life, to protect his ego. When you lie like Mark has, it's always going to come out. It always will. How long did he really think that he was going to get away with his lies? What was his plan? And why did he actually think that he was going to be able to get away with murdering his wife? Why couldn't he just accept that the game was up? Why did he resort to murdering his wife and his unborn child? Because don't forget, Laurie was pregnant. So the truth about Mark was finally out there. And after Mark's brothers heard this, this confession, they immediately reported it to the police and Mark Hacking, thank God, was finally arrested. But after the arrest, the detectives still had one more thing to do and that was find Laurie's body. Mark had said during his confession that he had dumped Laurie's body in a local dumpster that he knew was being collected that morning. However, by the time he had confessed this, Laurie's body had already made its way to landfill and the section where that dumpster was collected, the section of the landfill where that could have been, there was 4,000 tons of waste there. So the detectives had a huge task at hand, but they were not going to give up. They were determined to find Laurie's body to give her back to her family, to give her family closure. And thankfully, on the 1st of October 2004, over two months since Mark confessed to her murder, Laurie's remains were found. And not all of her remains were found. They actually had to identify Laurie from a jawbone that they found, which still had teeth in, and from dental records. That is how they were able to identify that the remains that they had found were Laurie's. And then on the 15th of April 2005, Mark made a plea deal with the prosecution and he was sentenced to six years to life in prison. I know, seems ridiculously low, doesn't it? But it turns out that this was the maximum sentence in Utah at the time, which is just crazy. Why would you give anyone six years for murder? And thankfully the law actually was changed because of this case. And the maximum sentence in Utah is now 15 years to life instead of six years to life. However, obviously Mark was still sentenced to six years to life, but the parole board straight away came out and said, don't worry, Mark is going to serve a minimum of 30 years. Like he's not gonna serve six years and get out, don't worry. And he will not be eligible for parole until 2035. So Mark remains in prison to this day, 17 years after he pleaded guilty. And that was the case of Mark hacking, which is just unbelievable. I find these cases so unbelievable where people murder somebody just to cover up their web of lies and their secret life. I just find this so crazy and it happens so often, doesn't it? And it's just beyond belief. He was supposed to be in love with Laurie. How can all of that change so instantly for you to murder her over your own ego? But the real tragedy here is that Laurie and her unborn child lost their lives. Laurie Suarez was a loving daughter, sister and mother to be and she would have been an amazing mother. She was smart, outgoing, caring and described as having a beautiful smile that would light up any room she entered. She had worked hard to get where she was in life. She was thriving in a successful career she was over the moon about becoming pregnant and she just couldn't wait to bring her baby into the world. But tragically, 
all of this was cut short and she was only 27 years old. And it's just really easy to forget how young she was when this happened. She was only 27. She had her whole life ahead of her. And my heart really does go out to Laurie's family. I've seen her mom speak out about this case and it's just truly heartbreaking because they were so close. Laurie was everything to her and it's just so incredibly sad. It really is. Laurie had so much to give to this world and her child as well. And it's just it's just so unbelievably sad. So that is the end of today's case. Let me know, as always, your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to let me know your case suggestions because I always wanna know what you wanna hear next. Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can get a free 30-day trial by going to the link in my description box and go listen to the book, If You Tell by Greg Olson. And that is everything from me. I hope you all have a really good week ahead and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.